I'd like to now invite Sadhvi Bhagwati Saraswati. She is uh, from the Parmar Niketan Ashram in Rishikesh. Uh, she's also the president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a leading voice in interfaith dialogue activities mm -hmm. worldwide, and also a promoter of Hindu-Jewish dialogue. Most respected Dr. Tahir, all of our distinguished leaders here, Sri Sudhindra Ji, and all of our sisters and brothers. Today, we've heard so much from so many beautiful leaders and teachers of all of the religions. I want to just speak about a few of the crucial points that I've heard raised during the day and how, to me, these relate to the people's sark that we're here for. The four tenets that I want to speak about, most of which you raised and then our other leaders have raised, are truth, love, peace, and freedom. But I'd like to begin with a short story, which is actually my favorite story. And it's a story of three men who are stranded on a boat in the middle of the ocean. And on the boat, they divide the boat into three separate compartments so that each man feels that he has his own, his own portion of the boat. So of course, they didn't bring duct tape on the boat with them, but the lines are nonetheless invisible, but meaningful to them. So with imaginary lines drawn in their boat, each of the three men feels content. Kitika ye, ye mira parte. One day, two of the men look over, and they notice that a leak has sprung in the third man's part of the boat. And they shout, and they say, stop up the leak. The boat is going to sink. We're all going to drown. And the third man says, oh, don't worry. It's only leaking in my part of the boat. Now, we all know that invisible and imaginary lines or no imaginary and invisible lines, if any part of the boat sinks, it's taking the whole thing with it. And as we're here today, something that is so obvious is that we're all in the boat together. And you spoke so beautifully about the importance of truth and truth as a fundamental religious tenant. And I know that Mahatma Gandhiji also had spoken about truth as God and God as truth. So let us take a moment and just look at what is the truth of this situation? What are the essential aspects of this situation? When we say a people's sark, when Sudindraji and his team have gone through so much to bring us together, which people is he talking about? Just the 100, 150 people in this room? Of course not. He wouldn't have gone through the trouble. It's all of the people. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the truth of the existence and the life being faced by the people whom we are here theoretically to represent? on whose behalf we are here to prepare and sign a declaration. And for the vast, overwhelming majority of them, that truth is one of hunger, of thirst, of illness due to hunger and thirst, of illiteracy. Our respected cardinal spoke so beautifully about love, and the world is a family. In the Bible, Jesus tells us, love thy neighbor as thyself. In Hinduism, we say, Vasudev Kutumbakam. The world is a family, and in a family, the hunger of my family member is my hunger. Their thirst is my thirst. Their pain is my pain. Their suffering is my, my suffering. In a family, we share. We don't hoard. We don't exploit. And yet today, in our global family, 
every 21 seconds, a child is dying due to not having enough water to drink. 200 million people just in the South and West Asian countries, 200 million don't have access to water. 20 crore Indians, just in India, I couldn't find the statistics for all the SART countries, but just in India, 20 crore people sleep hungry. Globally, 40,000 children are dying of starvation every day. 3,000 of those are in India. 3,000 Indian children are dying of starvation every day. If that's not terrorism, I don't know what is. When our boat is sinking, really sinking, it's not the time for us to worry about where the borders between your room and my room end. It's not the time for us to worry about what prayers you said in the morning, what prayers I was planning on saying in the evening if this boat weren't sinking. It's time for us to come together and save the boat. And so when we talk about peace, that's the peace that we need to talk about. It's no longer enough for us just to say, thou shalt not kill. That we shall not any longer throw bombs on each other or poison each other or stab each other or throw missiles across borders or destroy each other's houses of worship. Peace now needs to include that through no acts of a mission or commission, through nothing we do and nothing that we should have done which we didn't do, are our brothers and sisters, our family in the world, going to have to suffer like that? Terrorism today is a monopoly. It's a monopoly of resources, and it's a monopoly of power. It's not just the seven or 15 or even 500 people we kill in these horrible acts of violence that take place every few years. It's the billions of our family members who our acts are killing. And we would be naive if we thought that just because we didn't actually take a knife and stab it into their heart that their blood isn't on our hands. It is on our hands. And so when we talk about peace, the declaration that Sudhindraji has prepared has such a, a wonderful section on the environment and and human rights. When we talk about freedom, freedom is not just the freedom to practice our religion. It's not just the freedom to go to our place of worship. It's the freedom to have some water to quench our parched throats. It's the freedom to have some food in our stomach. It's the freedom not to die of the cold in the winter. And so as we, the leaders and the followers of the religions, when we come together in the name of peace, it's imperative that we expand that definition into what are we going to do to prevent those acts of violence, those 3,000 children. If I told you right now a bomb is about to go off down the street, and 3,000 people are going to die. We wouldn't keep sitting here. We'd jump up. We would bring together every possible resource that any of us had to do whatever we possibly could do to prevent that. And that's exactly what's happening, just in India. Lastly, as we spoke about freedom, I just want to 
touch very, very quickly on something that our respected commissioner had mentioned when he was talking about the freedom to wear what we want to wear and eat what we want to eat. And of course, these are inviolable rights in many ways. And yet, as we're really here doing some soul searching, I think it's important to realize that freedom means that it only goes in so far as it starts to step on your freedom. I have the freedom to gorge myself as much as I want on food as long as it's not causing you to starve to death. I have the freedom to do what I want as long as it's not preventing you from availing of the most basic and really inviolable human rights. And the choices that we make today, what we wear, not whether it's a dhoti or pants, but what it's made out of. Where was it made? Who made it? And what we eat, vegetarian or non-vegetarian, these are not just personal choices. They're choices that are impacting every single person on this planet. We vote against, we rally against exploitation, and then we go out and we support it with our rupees. We engage in it in every meal and every shopping trip. So our freedom must be one that is freedom in a family. Yes, I'm free. That doesn't mean I'm free to burn your bed down or eat all the chapatis on the table. I'd like to conclude our respected cardinal shared a beautiful story of the Buddha, and I would just like to conclude with a very short story also from uh, the Buddhist teachings, which is that some of the Buddhist's disciples were preparing a book. And it was a very, very special book on the compilation of all of the teachings of the Buddha from his lifetime. And they went through great, great struggle and time and energy to really bring together all of these teachings. And then they had to go out and raise a lot of money to get the book published. So they finally raise all the money and they're just about to publish it. And there's an earthquake and people are suffering. And so they take all that they raised from the book and they use it to take care of the people from the earthquake. And then again, they go out and they raise the money again and they raise it again. And now there's a cyclone and people are suffering. So they take the money and they dedicate it to the cyclone victims. And again, they go out and they raise all the money. And finally, now the book is published. But what does it say? The Teachings of the Buddha, third edition. Thank you.